Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Tell Your Story. I'm Todd Nesloni, and each episode, I look to bring you different guests who have encouraged, inspired, or challenged me in one way or another and invite them on to share some of their story in hopes that it inspires you to tell some of yours. I am super honored and excited to chat with Blake Martin today. Blake, before we begin, kind of give everybody a little overview of who you are. Sure. Hello, everybody. I'm super excited to speak to Todd today. Um, as you said, my name is Blake Martin, and I am an international fashion show producer and content creator. Um, I travel the world creating content and fashion show production for some of the world's biggest brands. So that is what I do. You know, you, you kept that so humble because when 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 I see your work on social media and I see all the places you're involved in, you 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 are involved in a ton of great work with a lot of companies. And so, you know, before we dive into some of the current events that you and I are going to talk about that are going on today, I kind of want to just look back kind of at you and your career. And, and when did you know that this was a path that you wanted to head down? Um, Probably my entire life. It just has progressed. So... Um, early on um, in high school, my dream was to be a background dancer. Mm -hmm. um, I danced for B2K, Sierra, wow. Rihanna, so on and so forth, um, and continued that dream through college. Um, and one day, someone asked me to dance at a fashion show, and I just kind of fell in love with it and immediately left dance and started to produce and pursue fashion, and I have been in the fashion industry ever since. Well, you clearly fell in love with it if you just dropped it and ran straight over here to do this. And, and you know, you know, Blake, I found you from some of your work that you just released recently. Um, there's a young black boy that I follow on social media who is doing incredible work. And he was actually one of your featured models um, for something you're doing about. So, you know, as, as we move this conversation into this timely topic that is going on across our country right now, you know, before we start talking about this series of photos that I've seen, I kind of want to start from the beginning and asking you, how are you? How, 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 how do you process and work through what's happening right now? Um, it is a very interesting time for someone like myself on so many levels because one, as a African-American male, what is going on in the world is really tough for someone like me because quite frankly, it's unpredictable. You look at all of these situations and as much as you wish none of them ever happened, you also kind of wish that there was a thread, that there was mm -hmm. some moment that they all had where you could say, I will just avoid doing, saying this. But every situation is so unpredictable. And so you really say to yourself, this could realistically be me. Um, as a Black gay male, it's an added sense of pressure and fear because we get the same amount of hate, discrimination from every community. So mm -hmm. I say to myself, even if I was in a situation with an officer who, and I needed help, will I get the help because I am also mm -hmm. gay? Right. You know, that's really scary. And then the third piece of it is, is the police officer aspect. My mother was a sheriff. Um, oh my. My, my sister is a current cop. My uh -huh. best friend is a current police officer. So, you know, you also say to yourself, it's not all law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So my emotions are a little bit of everywhere as of recently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, and I appreciate you coming on and, and choosing to talk with me today because I know that in the many conversations I've had within the black community, the emotional spentness of the moment is, is not lost. And so I appreciate you talking. And, you know, I, like I said a minute ago, I found you from a new visual campaign that you are a part of. Um, and, you know, I found one photo and I think you've shared four, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken so far, and each one just took me aback not only with just how beautifully put together it was, but the powerful message that it sends. And so for my listeners or viewers today, tell me a little bit about how that idea for this new series came about. Absolutely. Um, I think that we are in a very specific time 
And I think as African-American individuals, we have to share our voices. And if I'm being honest, I am not the individual that is going to protest. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as much as I agree with it, I'm, I'm not going to protest. I'm not going to get on Instagram or Facebook and give some amazing, intelligent speech. That's just not me. Um, but it was very important to still share my voice. Mm-hmm. And I share my voice through my art and my creativity. And so I wanted to still speak out still tell people what I thought about the situation, but in my own way. Well, and you know, I, I, I just, I, I understand the emotion that I felt by just observing the art that you put out there. What was that like actually putting it together? Um, I think it was very emotional and it was very emotional because I think it was the first time, if I'm going to be honest, that I realized what was going on. So Mm -hmm. we have an individual of a photo we haven't released yet of a young man who is playing Tamir Rice in his photographs. And I remember his mother during the shoot saying this was an excellent and thoughtful parent. And I say, you know, why do you think that? I kind of just assigned kids to whom I thought they looked similar to. And she said, well, because he is the same age as Tamir when Tamir was shot and killed. Wow. And it kind of just, it, I was done. I, I looked at this 12 year old child with such innocence in his eyes and such joy in his heart. And I thought to myself, there is someone out there who executed a child. Mm-hmm. And I became so emotional. And then as the, the shoot progressed, I looked at these, you know, I looked at these beautiful black children and these beautiful black brothers. And I said to myself, I would have no idea what to do if one of these men that I'm shooting is next or what if it was me? And I just became so overwhelmed with such amazingness in the room that is the black male. And then I became enraged that there is a group of individuals hired to protect us that is trying to erase us. Mm -hmm. It was a very tough shoot to to be a part of and to execute, but I'm very proud of it. Well, you know, I gotta say, the the image that I saw um, was of the young boy that I already follow on Instagram because he, he posts such incredible photos, but it was it was of him laying down portraying George Floyd. And that's what introduced me to your work. But I think the one that struck me the most was um, the Trayvon photo, the that photo of just that young man just standing there with a bag of Skittles. Yeah. And I was just taken aback because, you know, sometimes I think we can see things sensationalized on the news and we can see whoever the news decides to portray that person is and, and what news platform you choose to follow portrays those people differently depending on who they are. And so, you know, when I saw that image, I thought, that's who they are. That's who Trayvon was. It may not be the same boy in that same picture, but that's who Trayvon was, was a young man with a bag of Skittles. And that's who George Floyd was, was a man on the ground with somebody on his neck. And from the perspective of it being kids in those positions, I mean, it was it, it wrecked me. And so with the models that you had in place, I know you mentioned the, the model of the one that's coming out soon, but with the other models, did any of them express what it meant to them to portray um, these m- memorialized people? I think, um, I think some of the older models that we featured definitely did. And I think it was very interesting because the young man who portrayed Trayvon you know, 20 minutes before we took that shot, he got out of the car at the studio at, because these are models I work with. He got out of the car and couldn't even slam the door. He ran up and he hugged me and he put his arms around my neck. He was like, Blake, I miss you. I love you. And then as I was shooting this, I said to myself, what if I never got that hug again? Like, this is just, you know, not okay. And then the, the gentleman who was playing Laquan you know, I kind of told them, these are the individuals that you are portraying. 
Um, so if you have ideas to bring to the shoot, absolutely. And he brought that red cap and gown that was very similar to Laquan's. And I said, wow, you know, how amazing that you had a red cap and gown. And he said, yeah. oh, you didn't know. We went to the same high school. So wow. this is Laquan's like high school graduation cap and gown. And the young man who plays Ahmaud Arbery is my actual brother. And so as I'm coaching him through the shot saying, I want you to tie your shoes like you're about to go for a jog and I want you in the position of stretching. He doesn't know this, but I was looking through the camera trying to push through because I said, if my brother was to ever go out for a jog and never come home, what I would be beside myself. And this is the reality of us. And what infuriated me about every single one of the images, every single one is that for none of these individuals, you can recall a crime. Mm -hmm. Not right. one. There was no person you say, well, it was injustice. However, mm -hmm. there was still this part that was done improperly. All of these people went out for a normal day, right. assuming they were coming home an hour later and they didn't. And it was, it's infuriating. So, you know, being a black man in America, how, how do you maintain hope in the midst of this amount of pain and injustice? And, you know, when you look back, I mean, it's it, it hasn't just existed within the last year or even last decade. And so how do you not lose sight that things can get better? You know, I'll be honest. Um, I don't have any hope. I, at the moment, I don't because my, my family grew up in Alabama and Mississippi, and I would hear my grandparents speak about um, some of these same things. And I remember my mother recalling some of these same things growing up in the 50s. And you say to yourself, that was the 50s. It was ages ago. This thing, this would never happen again. And here we are in the midst of it all over again. And so for me to have hope would be for me to say the end is near. Right. And I just don't think it is. I think we're going to get to a place where it dies down, where things surface a little bit. But unfortunately, there's the fear that in 20 years, I'm going to be sitting with my son having right. these same conversations. Right. And so what's scary about it is, again, these are individuals who committed no crime. And so I leave my house every day, unfortunately, cleaning up to the best of my ability because I say, what if I don't come home and someone has to enter my home to pack up my belongings? Whenever I leave my home, I send text messages really saying goodbye to the people that I love because I don't know if once I get in my car, that's going to be it for me. You know, and it's, it's so arresting to hear you say that knowing too that you know you come from a family of officers and so you know that you know the power that when you have somebody in those positions who is doing it well the importance of that and that it's not an issue like you I know you're not of the belief that every officer is bad you've seen in your own mother you've seen in your sibling that you know no I I know that it can be done well but it doesn't mean that it eliminates the fear for you when going and being a part of those things. And, you know, I think that's something that those of us who are white, we haven't had to have those fears. And I think a lot more people are beginning to realize that now as we begin to have more of these conversations. And so, you know, my audience is primarily educators because that's the profession I'm in. And statistically they're predominantly female and predominantly white. And so, knowing that that's some of the audience, what would you have to say to them, to us, to me, that ways that we can be better allies and supporters of the rights of all? Um, I think that the best thing that can be done is to be aware um, and sympathetic um, to the problem, we as the African-American community wildly are aware that you guys will just never get it, but it's not your fault. Right. But at the same time, there's also an expectation of understanding. You know, prior to COVID-19, I was an executive at Uber. And I remember 
when some of these deaths were happening and beatings were happening and killings were happening, I would go into, you know, work and go into these management meetings and be the only African-American and only African-American male and killings would be all over the news. And my white superiors would ask me, well, what's wrong? Why are you having a bad day? And my, my response would be, how can I not? Yeah. And they would listen, true enough. But even after the conversation, it would be like, well, we still need the reports. We still need you to kind of buck up and this right. is a job. And I would always feel you have no understanding of what I am going through. And that almost is, that almost diminishes how I feel because mm -hmm. it's almost to say, I get it, but it's no big deal. Right. So for us, acknowledgement and understanding, especially for educators, because, you know, post my mother's career in the force, the last 30 years of her life before she passed away, she was an educator on the high wow. school level and college. Um, and so I understand, you know, how educators have to connect with students, mm -hmm. what they can and cannot say. I get it all. But there's a certain level of compassion that has to be shown. And sometimes in the midst of this moment, understanding that at times your hand on our back feels monumental right. to say it's easy for us to say it's not all police officers because it's not. But to be honest, it's sometimes difficult to say it's not all white America right. because sometimes we miss the white America who says we're not for this. Right. Well, you know, I, I just, I love the, the things you have to say and your perspective and, and your honesty with me. And, you know, you are in a creative industry with a wide variety of individuals that you work with. And, you, you know, what uh, I'd love to just kind of, as we begin to wrap this conversation, one of the a couple last questions I have is, you know, even though you're in a creative industry, even though you're in an industry that sometimes prides itself on having a variety of voices at the table, do you still find yourself fighting for a place at the table, fighting for your voice to be heard, even though that stereotypically that is an industry that most people see as, as being more inclusive? Absolutely. Um, you know, being in the fashion world and know that it is predominantly um, run by individuals who look like yourself, it's an everyday struggle for me to feel good enough and to feel um, worthy. Even as of today, I had a moment, you know, even as of two hours ago where I felt so unmotivated and so mm -hmm. discouraged and said to myself, do I really even want to keep pursuing this because I am a black male. Right. They're never going to let me sit with them. So mm -hmm. this pursuit is void even with the images you know I, I created them for a voice and I created them to bring awareness and I'll be honest you know I kind of became disappointed because in my head I said to myself these images are so powerful right. once they're released it's going to be an explosion of our voice mm -hmm. and then when it wasn't I said to myself well what did you expect it's just black boys like right. it's only so much they're going to allow us to have and so yeah we're always in the in the mindset of i deserve to be at that table and even if i get a seat at that table i'm going to be the one person at the table that isn't in on the conversation got it I'm, uh, I just, I applaud you and, and your vulnerability today. And, you know, Blake, one question that I always love to end any conversation that I have on Tell Your Story is just that idea of, I, be, I know there are things that we hold close to our hearts and our beliefs and are who we are. And so for anybody who might be listening or watching today, if they were to walk away with one thing, what would your one thing be for them? Um, never be afraid of your voice. It is valid. It is important. And no matter how uncomfortable it makes someone feel, scream as loud as you possibly can. That is, that's perfect. Well, Blake, you know, you're, I, I know I told you this before and I know I've said at the beginning on air, but your work, uh, you know, and, and 
the one that I just fell upon yesterday just blew me away and left me just emotionally just just arrested with just how powerfully visual it was. And, you know, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate your voice and being out there and sharing, even when you're struggling with the doubt, which is something I've talked about in every single episode, every guest has shared their, their struggle with that. And so I, I appreciate your vulnerability, your honesty, but your art and your vision and your bravery to continue to use your voice, even when you have been around people who've told you it's not a voice that needs to be heard when you felt like nobody was listening just know that there are countless people like myself who haven't reached out until just recently, but your work is just something that I can't wait to amplify even more along the platforms I have because I feel like sometimes art is that bridge that helps people understand things differently. And so I, I encourage you to keep sharing your voice because it is needed, it is valued, and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure people see the work that you're doing. So thank you, Blake, for spending a few minutes with me today. I appreciate you so much, and I look forward to having another conversation soon. And thank you, everybody, for listening or watching another episode of Tell Your Story. I hope today's conversation with Blake has encouraged you to get out there and share your story because every story matters.